Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. We are talking, once again, part two, bad plants, good plants. And we have got uh, two more bad plants selected for you. And I, of course, not doing this by myself. I'm joined, as always, every week by a co-host, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Did you get everything moved inside last week? I've is so everything was moved inside, and then actually over lunchtime today, I've moved it all back out into the driveway, and I watered it because it was so dry. Um, <laughs> we are still really dry in our neck of the woods, and so I I had to move everything in before having to water it, and yeah, just just constant watering. And you'd think I would have to stop watering now, but still doing it. Yeah, I'm getting to the point. I think I have to start watering some trees and shrubs in our yard because i'm gonna get a little worried we're not gonna have enough water when we hit winter yes so yeah we we had a few soaking rains and by a few i think i could count them on two fingers so <laughs> in this last like three months um you know really since june uh, i think we've had two soaking rains and that's about it and when i just looked at the extended forecast because i need to know when's it gonna rain next not a drop has been forecasted for at least the next week to 10 days. Yeah, like single digit chance of rain. <laughs> yes, yes. So. It is dry right now. Um, I was sitting out after watering the plants. I sat out in the back deck, had lunch, and there's lots and lots of dust and pollen and stuff in the air right now, uh, mostly because harvest is happening with soybeans and corn all over our part of the world. So um, it's just, it's dusty outside, it's dry. And and now it's going to get cold, Ken. It's going to get like really cold. Oh, was it Friday supposed to be down in the 20s at night? Yes. Yes. I get to go camping. <laughs> <laughs> have, have fun with that. <laughs> I'm not going to be ready for this. No, no. But it, it will be all right. We'll be nice and warm. We'll just, uh, everyone will just snuggle up together in the tent and um, we'll, we'll weather the, the cold just fine. So, but Ken, we're not here to talk about cold weather. We're here to talk about bad plants. And and folks, we did a part one last week where we talked about Japanese barberry and winter creeper. And both of those plants are not necessarily considered an invasive species, but they are species of concern. And Ken, what is an invasive species when we talk about, when we use that term invasive, what does that mean? So for, for our purposes, it's listed as in the state of Illinois is Invasive, so it's like a legal definition of, you know, you can't sell that plant um, in the state because of its it's aggressive or it outcompetes um, nat native plants and stuff. It's an introduced species and stuff. So even though those are those two are invasive elsewhere, they are not invasive in Illinois as of That's right. October two thousand twenty-two. That's right. <laughs> So legally, you can still buy and plant these plants in your yard. And we have, uh, last week, we gave alternatives to those, uh, you know, if you're so inclined, because both Ken and I, we do um, see these plants escape out into natural areas. And so we, we gave alternatives. And this week, we have two more uh, bad plants for you. And again, these aren't bad plants. They have no emotions or feelings about what they're doing. They're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. So can't necessarily be angry with them. Can we, Ken? We shouldn't be. <laughs> they're just plants. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we have two more bad plants. We're going to give you some alternatives this week. So Ken, well, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off with this week's bad plant. And also just keep in mind, this is a species of concern, not necessarily listed as an invasive species here in Illinois yet. So if you live in some other state, it probably is, but mm -hmm. not in Illinois. Uh, so the one I got this week is calorie pear, often referred to as Bradford pear, which is one of those are the first cultivar of this uh, that was planted or, or discovered and, and released. So this is one that is widely planted, very widely planted mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of landscapes. You know, it's a nice quick growing tree um gets what 20 30 feet tall a nice round form uh produces a, a lot of flowers in the spring personally i think they smell terrible they smell um, awful I, yeah i don't know i don't know if i've met somebody who likes the smell of them 
Um, Aren't they, they, they're fly pollinated, right? I see a lot of flies on them in the springtime. <laughs> Given the smell, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, they smell terrible, I think. Um, so I don't know why, you'd, I don't know, just because of the smell, I don't know why you'd want to plant it, but a lot of people do. Um, and then they're, another issue with them is they are um, kind of weak trees, a lot of narrow crotch angles. We get, when they get larger, uh, we get a, snowstorm ice storm heavy winds things like that uh, they can tear themselves apart because they have these weak weakly attached branches and a kind of weak wooded tree um, so they've always a hazard there and then now we're starting to see fruit being produced in these and then eaten by birds and distributed throughout the landscape um, mm -hmm. but doing a little background research on this i found an article uh, from the arnold arboretum at harvard university they had a a write-up on calorie repair. So I figured I'd talk a little bit about the background of it, which is which is kind of interesting. And we can link to the entire article uh, in the notes because it's I think it's worth the read. I found it interesting, but mm -hmm. maybe you will too. Um, so back in the early or the end of the 19th century, um, you know, out west, a lot of land was beginning um, being kind of transitioned from kind of rangeland into cropland. Uh, so there's this kind of push to find new crops that could be grown out there. Uh, so people were being sent out to find this new plant material. One place they were being sent a lot was China. China has a similar climate to a lot of the United States. Um, there's a lot of plant material there that could potentially be used here. Uh, so people were sent there uh, to find plant material that could be introduced into the U.S. and potentially used as a crop. Um, also in the, in the early 1900s, started having issues um, in the Pacific Northwest with on pear trees, so French pear. So if you're going to be eating, buying from the store with fire blight, so that was kind of decimating that industry. So there was a big push to find different pear species that can be um, bred with these eating types so we can get fire blight resistance. So that kind of increased that push to find a new pear species. Some were brought back. None of them were found to be um, fire blight resistant. Some more research, some more explorations uh, found that calorie pear, as well as another species, do have fire blight resistance. So then ma massive quantities uh, were brought back. Uh, I think one person, um, what was it? So they would bring back a hundred pounds of seed um, back to the United States out collecting in China. And it takes 5,000 pounds of fruit to get 25 pounds of seed. So there's a tremendous <laughs> amount of seed. That's a lot of seed. They're, they're bringing back and these were then planted out, <clears throat> out west and out east. Um, to kind of test them and start doing some breeding and stuff. Um, it was found that they were fire blight resistant and they could be used as a rootstock. So that was kind of the initial use. Um, but I'll read the description one of these people had for this, um, for these plants. And uh, I mean, nowadays from the lens of 2022, it's, it should send off a bunch of alarm bells. But for them, it, it I mean, this makes it a good plant, but. Yeah, it was a cool um, plant. <laughs> So in its ability to endure diverse and adverse soil conditions, this species certainly is a marvel. I found it growing in all various soil types, ranging from heavy clays to light sandy soils and disintegrated rock. I found it growing in shallow ponds, along streams, well-drained moist loams, and on very poor hillsides and hilltops. In places it was observed uh, where the layers of soil above the bedrock was no more than eight inches deep. And this was uh, Frank Reimer, who was at the Southern Oregon Experiment Station uh, when Frank. he was over in China looking for stuff. So, you know, that sounds like, you know, this tree can grow anywhere. This would be a great tree, which is what they're thinking. But if you think of it from the lens of today, that sounds like it can grow anywhere. And this is going to cause a problem yeah. down the road. But they weren't thinking that way. So, again, the benefit of, of hindsight we have nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a rapid, vigorous grower. has a long growing season as leaves remain green and lusty until very late into the fall. So again, some more desirable characteristics that can also <clears throat> cause some problems like we're seeing here down the line. Um, so they planted these out, found these, you know, to test fire bite resistance. They found it, they started using it as a rootstock. Uh, then in the early 1950s, they found a, a, a cultivar, a variety cultivar, whatever you want to call it, um, that was really attractive, that was, from these original seeds. So this was a 33 year old tree, um, had thick glossy leaves, attractive globular form, and it had a lack of sharp spurs or thorns, uh, which the 
calorie pear typically has is covered in thorns and stuff. Um, so they took this, planted it out in some subdivisions in Maryland. Uh, people really liked it. So this is the cultivar Bradford. So this mm -hmm. was made, this is released in 1961 and it was planted all over the place um, in the Eastern US. But by, so this is about 20, 25 years later, early 1980s, started seeing problems showing up with Bradford pear. Like I mentioned earlier, it'll break apart because as these weak crotch angles, kind of weak wooded. Um, so they started noticing problems in the eighties with how kind of strong this tree is. Um, and then after Bradford, you know, they're, they've got these massive plantings of these and they're starting to find other, uh, cultivars getting released. We've got things like white house, which is a narrow columnar form, uh, red spire, which has red foliage in the fall, autumn blaze, uh, Avery park, grant street, yellow out of Oregon. Uh, we have some out of Ohio and Kentucky. So aristocrat was found in independence, Kentucky, um, Cleveland select Chanticleer Stonehill all came from the same tree in Cleveland, Ohio. And then Cleveland select or, or Valzam was a kind of an offspring of Cleveland select. So now we've got all these different cultivars that are being introduced and widely planted. And in fact, in 2005, Chanticleer was chosen as the urban tree of the year by the Society of Municipal Arborists. So just to kind of show how popular this these trees yeah. became in. I bet they regret that decision. <laughs> <laughs> yes, probably. They probably tell us to cut that out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I found some reference, like there are some owners, homeowner associations that require you plant calorie pear um, in, in the front yard. So oh. just kind of show how, how widely popular this plant was and, and still is in a lot of places. Um. And this article says that in 2009 alone, calorie pear, which includes Bradford and all those others, was $23 million in sales in the U.S. Oh, just one year. I'm assuming it's a lot less than that now, um, but still, I'm, I'm assuming people still make are making quite a bit of money off selling and calorie pear for yeah. better or worse. But the, I mean, you, you mentioned 2015's when the municipal arborist named it the 2005, plant. 2005 was or, the, the yeah. Yes. 2005. We'll, we'll fact check that later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, between then and now, I mean, it, it's really kind of blown up into a problem that one day you go to sleep, not an issue. The next day you wake up and suddenly your backyard is full of it and mm -hmm. seen a lot of, a lot more people becoming more aware of it. Um, because it, it happens a lot of times in the spring when you're driving around and you're just like, where are all these white flowering trees all over the place? Like they yeah. could be some other dogwood or something like that, but, but probably, probably not. not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of the issue is that pretty much all pears, including calorie pear, are not self-fertile. So they need to be crossed. They can't pollinate themselves. So when Bradford was released, those are all cuttings of each other. So they couldn't pollinate each other. So you didn't have any fruit production. But then you start releasing all these other cultivars, they can cross pollinate. And now all of a sudden you've got fruit production. So you had a, a neighborhood, of just nothing but Bradford pear. Somebody's tree comes down, they replace it with a Cleveland select. Now that one tree can pollinate all those trees in the neighborhood and vice versa. And now you've got fruit production everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of why I, I think we're really starting to see it explode now because We've got these different cultivars and, and recently, I mean, within the last probably 20, 30 years, it's really exploded because we've got these different cultivars. It takes a few years for them to start flowering. So you probably don't notice them at first. And then after what, three, four years, all of a sudden they're flowering. Yeah. And you notice them everywhere. Uh, another potential issue could be is that, again, these are all cuttings and they're hard to root. So they're grafted onto seedling rootstock. So that seedling rootstock is going to be of calorie pear is different than that that scion that named cultivar so that rootstock um sends off suckers that bloom they can pollinate each other so even if we were to you know only plant one cultivar you still have that potential of the rootstock blooming so now it's 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 widespread like you said natural areas i know in between uh, jacksonville and springfield on um, interstate 72 there's some areas in the spring you look out and it's just nothing but white um, mm -hmm. 
that, you know, seven, eight years ago. I don't know if I noticed. I just didn't notice or it wasn't there. I don't, what think, the situation I, I don't think it was there, really. I mean, it wasn't. But it, then this is just a story amongst nursery growers. So I don't really... I can't confirm this or anything, but but a lot of them say that the Bradford series, the ones that were developed on the West and East Coast groups, those were genetically similar enough that they wouldn't produce that viable fruit. But it's when they made that Cleveland series type selection, suddenly the genetics were different enough. Now we're getting viable fruit from these uh, two or multiple or various varieties out there. Yeah. And birds like them. Mm-hmm. And they'll eat them and they'll sit on power lines or you know, other trees, deposit them, and and there you go. So and then they just start popping up everywhere. And I think a lot of times those seedlings have thorns mm-hmm. and things like that. So they're they're choking out native species and they're full of thorns and stuff. So you can't, you know, it, it makes it uncomfortable for people to walk through there because they're yeah, they got giant thickets of thorny trees and stuff. Yeah, it, 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 the thorns have thrown me when I have found ornamental pear like deep in woods when I'm going on a walk or something or a hike. And I come across this tree and I was with a group of people as part of a tour with extension. And they're like, what's this tree? I'm like, well, there's thorns all over it. So I was racking my brain. I'm like, it looks just like a pear, but all the pears I know don't have thorns on them. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, go check on the phone or something and look it up. It's an escaped ornamental pear. It just it throws you for a loop. You're just not used to seeing that. Yeah. So those are the reasons why you know a lot of places they're considered invasive. There are some states. Uh, I think it was so stuff from Kentucky and Missouri where they actually have bounties mm-hmm. on on cattle repair. So if you have a cattle repair in your yard, you cut it down, you show proof of it, you can get a free tree to replace oh, it. That's so cool. So there, we need a lot to do of places that. doing that. Yeah. Um, to get rid of them because they are causing starting to cause so many problems. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. so as far as this management goes, you know, if you've got one, consider cutting it down. Uh, I did see some references to, you know, when the plants are in bloom, you can spray um, ethophon or some other plant growth regulator while it's blooming. <clears throat> it won't get rid of the flowers, but it'll prevent it from setting fruit. You got to get the timing right. It's got to be in full bloom before, um, before fruit sets. So you have a limited time window, but you can, do that and it's supposed to eliminate 95% of the fruit. Um, you know, if, if you've got one and you don't want to cut it down right away, that may be something to look at. But so I think I think both of us would encourage you to mm-hmm. find something else. Yes. Well, it, in that vein, Ken, let's say we want to cut it down. What <laughs> can we replace this? Uh all of the all of what you have described is awful, awful <laughs> plant. What are some alternatives here? All right, so for alternatives, I, I kind of focused on smaller trees that are they bloom um, in the spring, or they have uh, and they have nice fall color, kind of like why we've grown Bradford and, and all these other cultivars. Uh, so first one, flowering dogwood. I mean, this is another mm-hmm. kind of widely planted. It's a native, and there's other types of dogwood. There's what cornelian, no, is it cornelian cherry dogwood? Uh, cornelian, yeah, cherry dogwood, yeah. So there's there's all kinds. Flowering dogwood is is a native species. This cornice, Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, small tree, 15 to 30 feet tall. It's got those white, large, showy flowers, which aren't really flowers, um, but we call them flowers. That's right. And they'll and they'll produce red berries in the fall, which birds will eat. So again, you get that wildlife uh, benefit to growing this. Uh, red foliage in the fall, uh, so they get good fall color. And there's a bunch of different varieties and cultivars out there. Um, anthracnose can be an issue. Um, with dogwood some sometimes so that'd be something to think about if if you've got them growing in your area and you see them having issues it's maybe one to to steer clear from because uh, that has can cause some problems another one look at is service berry get another small uh multi this is a multi-stem tree again 15 35 feet tall flowers in the spring fragrant uh, flowers and again producing reddish purple berries uh, that birds will feed on as well orange to red fall color. Uh, so you kind of got this year round interest and it's considered a, to be a pretty good street tree. So it can be tolerant of, of some more of our urban conditions. Um, so depending on where you have your, your calorie pair, that may be a good replacement. Uh, red bud. This is a, another real common, one. at least here in Jacksonville, we've got red buds 
all over the place, it seems like. So another native species, uh, small, kind of more of a spreading tree, depending on where it's grown, 20 to 30 feet tall. Uh, and I think these are a little bit longer lived than some of our other small trees. Um, some small trees can be kind of short lived, which is a, is a drawback of them. Yeah, that's in their nature. But there's some interesting breeding going on with redbud. Um, there's a lot of weeping habits that are being propagated. And uh, one that comes to mind off the top of my head is rising sun, not weeping, but um, the coloration of the leaves as they emerge in the spring is different all along the, the stem. So yeah. from like, like a sunrise almost. Is that the one from under the canopy? Yeah, like I think it one. is. Okay. Yep. Yep. Oh, I saw that somewhere. Uh, and then with, with red bud, you get those pink purple flowers that mm-hmm. they're growing on, on the stems and the trunk, um, which is pretty cool looking, uh, especially when you get larger trees, you can get some really, really kind yeah. of awesome looking plants. Uh, and they're in the bean family. So they'll produce those kind of almost kind of like flattened green beans, um, for seeds. They have heart shaped leaves, which are kind of unique looking, uh, and they have yellowish foliage in the fall. Um, uh, so my neighbor has a. Um, one of our neighbors has a red bud and I've noticed the last few years, we're getting a lot of red bud seedlings popping up yep. in our yard, which when we first moved there, I didn't notice some, but last couple of years we've had quite a few and they're not well, in very soon, convenient places. Oh, darn. I was going to say soon, Ken, you can have your own red bud tree. So I've got one that maybe we can, I may dig it out and see if I can bonsai it or something, but mm-hmm. yeah, I, I would like for them to seed themselves in a little more convenient. Yeah, that's places, true. But We'll see. <laughs> uh, another one would be a fringe tree. So this is another one, small shrub or s- large shrub, small tree, uh, kind of a spreading round habit, 12 to 20 feet tall. So, you know, on the smaller side there, uh, they have these flower clusters with the kind of strap like fringe like petals on them, creamy white uh, that are also fragrant. These are dioecious. So you have separate male and female plants and males typically have a better um, flower display. Uh, compared to females but the females will produce uh, fruit olive like fruit that will turn uh, bluish black and birds will also um, readily feed on another wildlife too so you get that that extra benefit um, of that and then they've got um, yellow fall color um, as well hawthorns uh, would be another one to look at so we've got washington horth hawthorn green hawthorn um, there's some other species as well. 20, 35 feet tall, you get white flowers. Uh, Washington hawthorn is going to bloom later than some of the other species. And then they'll all produce kind of a red fruit that, again, uh, birds will feed on. Uh, green hawthorn will have purple to red leaves in the fall. And the bark on mature trees can exfoliate and have orange inner bark. So again, some, some multi-season interest there. Uh, Washington hawthorn is more of orange-red coloring in the fall. These do have thorns, um, so you probably want to look for a thornless cultivar. There are some <laughs> out there. Uh, growing up, we had a, a hawthorn tree in our front yard by the driveway uh, and lost a couple basketballs <laughs> to, to the tree. Uh, they that sharp. They, they can yes. have some pretty good thorns on them, um, so keep that in mind. Or plant it outside your kids' windows instead of barberry. <laughs> 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 Last one we'll kind of go into detail on is wild plum. So this is another smaller tree, 15 to 25 feet tall. Uh, or can be a multi-stem shrub. So if you don't want that, keep those those pruned back. Keep those suckers pruned back. Uh, it can also have thorns. Um, so a lot of times it's more of a natural setting than maybe a, a nor- uh, home landscape, but you know, it, it could be an option. If you don't like good smelling flowers, this would be another option for you. If you want to replace your stinky calorie pear with another stinky flowering plant. Uh, wild plum <laughs> supposedly does not have a particularly attractive smelling flower, um, but they will produce um, edible fruit that we can eat, wildlife will eat. Uh, they'll turn um, bright yellow or red with bright yellow pulp inside and they'll um, ripen in early summer. So if you can beat the wildlife, um, you could eat them. And then yellow uh, fall color. Um, but like they've got these pretty good sized fruits, a lot of wildlife um, you know, blooming in the spring. All these are blooming in the spring. So those nectar resources for bees and other pollinators uh, as well. Just a few others you could do, magnolias, something like a sweet bay magnolia, um, umbrella tree, a couple different types of smaller magnolias you could do. 
Um, crab apples would be another one. Um, they can look like we mentioned them before the, we started recording. They can look kind of rough uh, in the fall. They have there's a lot of diseases, a lot of rust. A lot of the diseases we get in apple production will also get into crab apples. So if you've got apples in your landscape, maybe not crab apple, maybe not hawthorn, because some of those diseases will can jump from each other. But um, just keep that in mind. They, crab apples and hawthorns can have some disease issues um, yes. associated with them. I think that is a great list, Ken. The, um, you know, I'm just thinking of, of, as you describe these plants, I go through, you know, memories in my head. Uh, like fringe tree was the first plant I ever memorized to be able to identify. It was right outside the SIU ag building door and it had fruit. So it was obviously a female tree and the flower show every spring was lousy. So what you just said about male, female trees, of course, that makes sense. And then service berry, even though birds eat it, I have partaken in many also. And some years they're really sweet and really good. Other years they're really tart and sour. So it's just, <laughs> you have good years and bad years with service berry. And one thing I should mention for fringe tree, it has been found, emerald ash borer has been found in some trees. Um, it, I have not heard a lot about it since they got that initial discovery and news about it. So it doesn't sound like it's, you know, really widely affected by it, um, but it is a potential. It has been shown that emerald ash borer can survive and reproduce mm -hmm. uh, when growing in those. So keep that in mind. It doesn't seem like it's it's being affected like ash is. Um, yeah, but that may be something you want to keep in mind too if you're if if you're thinking of that tree. Yeah. At, at this point, I think what I've heard is that emerald ash borer and fringe tree right now, and this can all change. Keep in mind. Um, is kind of like lilac borer. You know, lilac borer goes after older, weakened stems of lilac. They think that's similar with emerald ash borer and fringe tree. Till that changes, we'll be back on to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have for us this week for bad or naughty plant? Uh, the one of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and by, like one of the, it's like it's just like your your uh, uh, calorie pair though. It's in everybody's yard, and that is burning bush, uh, known as also winged euonymus. Uh, scientific name is euonymus elatus, uh, and that winged or the elatus describes the the kind of corky texture of the stems, and those that corky texture kind of creates these ridges or wings. Uh, that go along the length of the stem. So it's a really good way to identification characteristic if you're ever unsure uh, what you might be looking at. And that develops usually on older stems. But burning bush, it's it's one of those, it's like calorie pear, like why did we like this plant so much? Um, like calorie pear has the smelly white flowers. It's like about it. That's like they, they did some breeding for some other things like fall color, but burning bush, all it does is turn red in the fall and that's it. There's, there's so many more plants that do more than just that. So, um, but like calorie pear, burning bush, um, not from North America, imported, uh, non-native plant. And it is the, the golden child of plants. Um, as Ken described, not with calorie pear, with burning bush, nothing eats it here in North America. Um, it's easy to grow, grows anywhere, grows all over in the urban or rural environment, wherever you want to put it. Um, and it's just everywhere. It's, it's easy to propagate, it's easy to make money. It's easy to sell. So of course we're going to, we're going to sell a lot of this one. And Bernie Bush does have a couple different cultivars. Now, a lot of older landscapes are just going to have the sort of the straight species out there. It's going to be a pretty large shrub, uh, topping out at like 20 to 25 feet, most newer landscapes are going to have the dwarf or the compact version of burning bush. So that's only going to top out about waist high, maybe four or five feet at the most. Um, and so there has been breeding that's gone into this plant, but I, I just got to say, it's still just a, a, a one, uh, one hit wonder, you know, there's nothing <laughs> to it besides fall color. Um, it's got a nice fall color. It, it we'll, does we'll have give it, a we'll give it that. <laughs> it really does. Um, you know, and and so it will turn bright, brilliant red. And um, even though, and that's where it gets its name, burning bush, of course. Although I have set one on fire and um just just to be funny and ironic, but 
uh, it didn't like that. <laughs> so you cannot burn the burning bush unless you want to get rid of it. Um, most of my landscapes that are like homes that I've either rented or bought or whatever, have usually had burning bush somewhere within them. Uh, and all the houses that I have owned, I've had burning bush. The current house I live in does have one pretty large burning bush shrub. And it's kind of unfortunate because it is a great screening plant right now, like between me and the neighbor's house. It's like positioned perfectly to like block the view um, from my yard into the neighbor's yard. And so to remove that would create a big hole and my wife would not be happy and our neighbors probably don't want to watch what us, what we do out on the back deck or it'll watch our children scream all the time and uh, and us scream at the children. And, and yeah, so they don't <laughs> want to watch that. So, you know, kind of like what Ken said with um, managing plants invasive or non-invasive, but species of concern with like uh, plant growth hormone, which might reduce the amount of seed set in a plant in a particular plant if you spray the timing just right. It's really hard with burning bush because the flowers are indescript. They're not showy and nothing. You just you don't know. It, it is you have to really pay close attention to when these things are in flower or in bloom. Um, and so for myself, I do plan to remove the burning bush in my backyard, but it's going to take time. I basically have to expand the planting bed and start planting other plants around it to fill in, to create that screening effect that this bush has created. And then I can get rid of it without being yelled at, hopefully. Yeah, my, my parents have had some, this foundation planting, we cut those out and they're resprouting. So we need to do that again, but they've got some in their, in their windbreak mm -hmm. in front of the, the pine trees. So need to find cut those out and then have something to replace those with as their second level of, of windbreak. Yeah. And, 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 you know, yes, non-native they're aggressive. They spread it in natural areas. It's also where I hang my suet feeders in the winter time, because it is great cover for birds. That's dense twigs. And, you know, it keeps the hawks pretty much away from them. Um, and so the birds like to eat there. So, but again, so I'm going to have to try to replicate that habit or that form of that shrub, get that screening effect and figure out something to create nice fall color and such. But, um, the, the time when I'm like, I realized burning bush was a problem. Um, it was our master naturalist training in 2014. And we went to uh, Hornfield campus, which is Western Illinois university's kind of uh, natural area campus or, or uh, kind of research area station. And they took us into the woods and they showed us this hillside. It was fall and the hillside was green and bright red. Now, the bright red was the burning bush. The green shrubs can, would you wager a guess what the other species on that hillside was that was stayed green? No, honeysuckle. That's right. That was bush <laughs> honeysuckle. Um, so it looked like Christmas. And I can I have a picture of that. I'll throw it up right now. And as you can see, uh, this hillside is just, just covered in honeysuckle and burning bush. And they were doing stream sediment monitoring of the creek down at the bottom. And they showed that these species shade out any understory plants and they create sheet erosion, which increases the sediment in their creek. Um, I don't think that was any published research. That's just something that they monitored with students and kind of just was kind of a teaching tool for them. But so very interesting uh, thought there on terms of it escaping into the wild and actually making water quality worse. Whereas a lot of times we think more plants, water quality gets better, but that's not always the case. There's always, always caveats. Always, always, always. So Ken, I have I have searched the internet and I have so many plants to, to recommend as alternatives. Um, some that, that my family might find a suitable alternative, some which they might not like, but I'm going to go with one that I really, really like. And I, I really, really want to plant at least one of these. And that is American hazelnut. Um, American hazelnut is a native species it, it is the one of the hazelnuts. They know if you know about Nutella hazelnut spread, um, that's actually mostly made with European hazelnuts, but we can also do that with American hazelnut. Um, and so American hazelnut from this area, there actually has been some cultivated selections for this. 
Um, so there is one cultivar called Bailey Purple. So if you want to have purple leaves all year long, they have one of those. Um, so they have Bailey Purple, uh, has a purple leaf color, really interesting uh, plant. Uh, straight species uh, can have like a yellow fall color um, if we're just kind of focused on fall color. But the added benefit here of hazelnut is it has a harvestable crop. Um, you can harvest hazelnuts. I did a whole presentation on hazelnuts last winter. And so we can leave a link to that, including Ken's presentation on uh, chestnuts. And I think what, what else do we talk about? Acorns or something? Lots of nuts. <laughs> I don't remember what. Do walnuts. Oh, walnut. Pecans. We had walnuts. Do pecans. Pecans. Yes. Yes, all the edible stuff out there. And so we we had a lot of fun with that. So American hazelnut's going to be kind of my first look. I might see what type of cultivars are available out there. Bailey purple kind of being at the top of my list, but we will see. We'll find out what, what might happen from there. Another alternatives are uh, viburnums. And so uh, one that I have planted on the opposite side of my yard to kind of see what it's like is actually the Chicago luster viburnum. Um, this particular one I have noted quite attractive to deer. Um, so I was out there just this morning looking at the plant and it's like someone went in with little pruners and just like pruned the whole thing, <laughs> uh, has leaves and everything it's established, it's alive, but I'm not going to get any flowers next year because <laughs> deer have eaten the dips off of all the branches. And so, um, yeah, well, we'll see how that goes. But that is Chicago Luster. It's actually an arrowwood viburnum. Um, the other viburnum that I haven't grown, but I think is 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 a good selection, um, is actually a double file viburnum. And that's um, scientific name. Scientific name is ah placatum. Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured out the scientific name. It is viburnum. Placatum, um, which um, in the cultivar is opening day. Opening day because it has these like baseball shaped white flowers in the spring and just it's loaded with them. Um, also gets kind of this, this really beautiful mm, mahogany purple color uh, in the fall of the leaves. Um, but opening day, since it's placatum, it is hardy to zone five. So uh, if we get a particularly harsh winter, uh, you might lose your top growth. I don't think it'll kill the plant outright. Uh, if you're a little bit farther north in Illinois, might not be as, as hardy to your area. Um, so maybe consider something else that's a bit more adapted to northern parts of the state. But that's that, that's Viburnum Placatum, uh, zone hardiness, zone five. And so for me, I'm at kind of at the, re the top reaches of its uh, hardiness. Uh, there is another one which I, I actually have uh, grown before. My parents have grown this one, and, and that is uh, uh, Cephalansis occidentalis, which is, is that butter? That's not butterfly bush. Cephalansis, Cephalansis occidentalis. Button bush. Oh, my gosh. I'm glad you're here, Ken. Um, <laughs> yes, button bush. Now, button bush at least the one that was growing at my, my parents' place, it was big and sprawling and wide. It wasn't a great screening plant, but it is it, create, it has these little Sputnik-like flower balls. And then these little, it's just covered in these like the flower spikes coming off of them, like just little, little Sputniks, you know, kind of plants and flowers. Um, and they have some interesting different um, varieties that they're cultivars they've selected of that um uh, uh ruby red uh is it ruby red or something like that uh is actually they're usually white flowers ruby red could be wrong but double check that fact checkers of the internet um is a red flowered type so that would be so cool to, to see that but i would say probably the main type of plant that is going to replace at least my burning bush is going to be uh various types of hydrangeas um incredible uh, and it is kind of that uh, the mop head type hydrangea. It's, uh, it's got that, that big ball uh, on the end of the stem there. Um, Annabelle or Annabelle um, is kind of a, the old fashioned traditional developed here right in the state of Illinois, um, or at least selected here. Um, and, and I think it's Anna, Illinois is where they picked it. Um, 
is uh, it, 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 something that I could probably grow perfectly in the spot, except for the old fashioned type flops over pretty easily. And so I'm going to need to figure out a, a dwarf version. So maybe incredible. So I'm going to try one of those mop head hydrangeas, a dwarf type uh, in that area. And I'm probably also going to do a paniculata hydrangea, which um, probably the most popular cultivar is going to be limelight, but that is going to be too big for my space. So I may be a, a little lime or something like that, but, um, but, but little lime, there's also a diamond rouge or rouge, um, rouge. How do you say that? Rogue diamond rouge. rouge, rouge. I don't know. Something <laughs> it's red. <laughs> Um, and so it, it should be pretty neat. Um, th there's others like oak leaf hydrangea. Um, oak leaf hydrangea, um, I, I actually planted some of those in my parents' yard. We did the dwarf variety, and they were not very dwarf. They they grew and they spread, and they get awful anthracnose every year. So I, I might not put that uh, select that one. That was actually the dwarf variety known as Munchkin. And so I'm probably not going to use that one. There is one out there though, that gets beautiful fall color called jet stream. It's gets this red fall color. Um, and so that's oak leaf hydrangea. Uh, probably not going to put that one in my yard though. Uh, but just something to keep in mind. Um, Physocarpus, which is, um, which is, so I know these scientific names, but I can't remember. It's the nine bark, right? Yes, nine bark. I don't sure. know. <laughs> Just agree with me, Ken. Yes, that is what it is. <laughs> I will fact check that and throw the real name uh, here in the video. Uh, listeners who are on po audio podcast, uh, you're just out of luck, I guess. Um, but Amber Jubilee is a cultivar that that I'm looking at for Physocarpus, and it, it does have a nice fall color uh, and, and also a pleasant just decoloration of leaves throughout the year, kind of like a uh, dark purple, ambery color. There is a few others. Now, I, I did mention some that, and this is repli duplicated from uh, last week when we were talking about Japanese barberry alternatives, uh, but Father Gila, um, just the just the Father Gila gardenii or the, uh, the larger one, it has fall color. Sometimes it is yellow. Sometimes it is red. Um, Mount Airy is one. I might have mentioned it last week. Um, I said, I, if I did, I said it had yellow fall color. I was wrong. It has red fall color. Um, and so that Mount Airy is probably one that I would love to put in my yard somewhere. So it has this beautiful red fall color. Blue Shadow is another one that Actually, the leaves itself throughout the growing season are just blue, which is, blows my mind. Pretty cool. And then there's a couple others. So we mentioned last week, Aronia. Um, there's Low Skate Mound, which is a dwarf version of the Aronia. Um, a, a few others, though, just real quick. You know, Itea, Itea Virginica is a pretty neat one. Henry's Garnet or Little Henry are the ones that I'm most familiar with. There's got to be new developments in the breeding industry because that was back in like 20. 2006 when I learned those two cultivars of Itea uh, virginica. Uh, but Henry's Garnet is probably one of the most popular ones. Most of us are going to want something smaller like Little Henry, which is just like a dwarf version of that. They have these beautiful bottle brush, white uh, uh, bottle brush uh, shaped flowers, white, fragrant. Um, uh, they get red fall color. So they would be another good one to have. Now uh, here's one people don't often think about is blueberry. Um, blueberry, there can be some really good landscape qualities to blueberry. White flowers in the spring makes blueberries, which you can eat. And then it does get red fall color and the stems uh, sometimes will be red throughout the winter months. And so there is some, some uh, ornamental qualities to that. And there are some landscape breeders looking specifically at blueberry more for an ornamental standpoint than just the, the edible fruit. Now, keep in mind, blueberry uh, is in the Ericaceae family related to azalea and rhododendron, but blueberry really, like their cousins, likes acidic soil. So there's a whole other podcast worth of information about planting blueberry and getting it right. Um, probably some of those patio type blueberries might be a, a place to start and then graduate into planting them in the soil uh, a, a few years down the line. So 
Yeah, can I don't you you've grown all kinds of uh, fruits and things. Have you ever grown like a blueberry out in the yard? So I've got two of the the dwarf container blueberries. Um, little on top hat. And there's another one. I'm drawing like there's several different cultivars out there. So it used to be bushel and berry was the company i think it was with brazzleberries or they've changed names but they've got blueberries they've got raspberries <clears throat> dwarf meant for container products so we've got two blueberry varieties um and yeah so we have got them in pots so we don't have to worry about amending soils mm -hmm. uh, so and they do have some nice uh fall color haven't gotten too many blueberries um but that's probably more because of neglect on my part than the plant's <laughs> fault but we we put some blueberries in the ground this what was it last year and we got a pretty good yield just the next year um but there were some disease problems with those and um they were mystery blueberries we don't know what they were and it, it took considerable amount of of amendments for the soil um for us to put that in basically we dug out a trough and amended that with elemental sulfur and peat moss uh, cause you're, you're essentially replicating like a mossy kind of bog situation mm -hmm. with high, high amounts of acidity, uh, in that, that soil there for those blueberries to grow. But, but again, that's a whole nother podcast growing blueberries. So I don't think we've done. I don't think we have. We'll Add it to the that. list. Add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, Ken talking about all of these different plants reminded me of a comment that we got in last week's video is, Hey, can you put some pictures up of these and we do our best uh, for that. And so, uh, you know, if you're listening to this, there's always a link to a YouTube video version of this where you can see pictures uh, for most of our podcast. But um, there are these things called bots, which scour the internet for, for pictures that are not yours. And uh, organizations like ours can get, uh, can uh, infringe on copyrights. And so if they're not, our pictures like Ken and mine, we actually can't put those up there. So we will try to put as many pictures as we can in there. Uh, just know that we can't put as many pictures up as we wish we could. You know, we would just love to steal everything from, you know, Burpee or, you know, name your favorite nursery online grower. Yeah, it gets, it gets a little tricky sometimes. Or they have yeah. to be Creative Commons for commercial exactly. use. So, yep. Yes, there are some... We're not intentionally not putting pictures on there. There are some difficulties that we encounter when you got to turn this around in a couple of days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> if only we had more time. <laughs> well, that was a lot of great information about two more species of concern. Uh, we'll call them bad plants this week. Uh, and then some great lists of alternatives for calorie pair and burning bush. So folks, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension. And this week edited by me. So I guess I'm in the hot seat for getting pictures on here. Um, uh, Chris Enroth, uh, a special thank you to Ken Johnson, uh, co-host every single week. Thanks so much, Ken, for being with me. Hey, thanks for being here. We'll get that uh, burning bush cut out. Replace it. Yeah. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I, I need some some wood chips to uh, start making my beds bigger. There you go. Make sure you bring those plants in tonight too. Yes. This weekend. I don't don't want to forget that. So and, uh, I think we should do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. Next week, folks, we're leaving the species of concern and we're going into invasive species. Uh, these guys are listed, but... There's, there's this kind of extra little thing. You can still, uh, even though it's illegal to sell them in the state, you can still order them online. And people do that. Uh, things like floral arranging and stuff. So that's how they still keep spreading around the state. So uh, look for that next week where we talk about invasive species. Listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.